So in this video I want to talk about how I built the bouldering wall in my apartment and hopefully help anybody out who is going to take on a similar project. Remember, the more wall you build, the more your wall will cost. I was able to record a time lapse for most of the construction, so I'll play back some of that footage as I discuss my build. My wall consists of nine plywood panels and the total cost for everything including wood, hardware, flooring and the holds you see here was around 1800 Canadian. If that's not in your budget, you may want to start with a small single or two sheet wall which you can build for under $300. I know $2000 may sound like a lot for a climbing wall in your home, but remember, lots of people will spend that kind of money just on a couch for their living room. Before you begin, I recommend reading a few guides on how to build a bouldering wall that you can find on the internet. Matulis has a decent guide which I referenced to grasp the concept of my build. I'll link to it in the description below. The next thing you need to do is visualize your space. You can see my empty apartment here and I already began working out how I wanted to build my wall. It's important to take some measurements and find out where the studs in your wall are located. You can use the tap test to get started, where you listen to a hollow sound indicating empty space and a more solid sound which indicates a stud. If you're lucky, you may notice a painted nail head which was not hammered in all the way when the drywall was put up, and this will indicate a stud. Then there's also the strong magnet test, where you slide a rare earth magnet across the wall and hope it finds a nail in a stud and sticks. Personally, I find most of these methods rarely work, as the drywall is usually too thick. Using a stud finder is the best way to go. Even with a stud finder, however, you may have difficulty as there is often soundproof panels or foam placed in walls, pipes, wiring, improperly placed holders, and other anomalies which can all throw your stud finder off. The best thing to know is that a standard stud spacing is 16 inches. This means if you find an object which may be a stud, there should be another one 16 inches away, and so forth. Studs usually also start in corners. When in doubt, Find an empty spot on the wall with your stud finder next to an object and cut a hole in the drywall. You'll be able to look inside and see exactly what your object is. And repairing the hole you made is cheap and easy with some wall spackle and drywall patching. Now that you know where your studs are, you can work on your design. Building your wall in a 3D modeling program like SketchUp or even drawing out crude schematics will be a huge help. I toyed around with a few ideas for the space I had and decided to go with what you see here. Zero or 90 degree angle walls are flat and easy, but they get boring fast. If you have small children, however, this may be enough to keep them entertained. A 15 degree wall like the one I built here provides for some easy climbing, but still enjoyable. 45 degrees is where it starts to get a little tougher, as seen here on this wall. Now I don't have a 60 degree wall, but those can also be very challenging. Remember, the bigger your slope, the more space it's going to horizontally take up. And of course, for the more advanced climber, there is the roof section, as you can see I have two of them right here. However you build your wall, remember that you can always attach sloped volume boxes onto it later to increase difficulty and create new problems. When making your framework, keep in mind that the sheets of plywood come in 4 by 8 foot sizes. You generally want to use 2x6s as your main support and 2x4s for bracing. You can see some of my work here and how I made the outside and middle framework with 2x6s and then the inside I used 2x4s. I've also added in bracing between the joists to increase stability. I actually over engineered my wall quite a bit, which is usually how I build everything I make, as it's better to be safe than sorry. It's best to read a guide for how to construct everything together. Some things I want to mention that I had trouble finding information about, however, was the different types of screws and lengths you will need. I built the whole framework on its own set of studs, screwed into the studs of the wall. This was mainly to allow me to drill in anywhere safely and add support from the ground. My building is also old, so it doesn't hurt to have some new wood to build this on. To secure my framework to the structure, I used 12 by 4 screws with a Robson head. These are quite thick and required me to pre-drill holes to prevent wood splitting. The minimum I would recommend using is a number 10 screw. Number 8 will be fine for holding the plywood boards up to the framework, but not to hold the framework to the building structure. All screws should ideally be Robson head screws. Phillips head screws strip a lot easier and don't always provide the torque required while building. You're going to need various lengths of screws from 2 inches for plywood fastening to longer for stud attachment. 
what I ended up doing is buying a huge number of screws and then returning the ones I did not use. Any major hardware store should have a decent return policy which allows this. It could save you a lot of trips to the hardware store. Decking screws, or construction screws, are what you want to use for the bulk of your wall. They are self-drilling. You do not need to pre-drill a hole to prevent wood splitting, unless you're extremely close to an edge. They also have their own countersink, so they don't stick out of the wood and allow you to place holds or more wood on top. Decking screws only come up to a number 8 in thickness, and construction screws a number 9. So for the thicker screws, you'll need to go with wood screws, and ensure you pre-drill your holes and countersink when need to. When drilling holes for your holds, there are three ways to do it. A grid, a crisscross, or random pattern. I did a random pattern for mine as it seemed to be less work and gives a more natural look. Make sure you read which drill bit is required for your T-nuts. Most T-nuts use 7 by 16 sizing, but some may use half an inch. You don't want to drill half inch holes though for T-nuts that only need 7 16 to do the actual drilling, you always want to drill in on the climbing side of the wood, so any splinters happen at the back. It's best to use either a brad bit, Fostner bit, or other self-drilling bit. These bits will give you a cleaner hole and make it so you do not need to push down on the drill for every hole. Bosch sells some really nice bits in these categories. T-nuts come in two varieties. They're the ones with jagged spikes that you hammer into your holes, and others that you push in and secure with three screws. I went with the screw-in kind. They are nearly double the price of the hammer-in prong ones, but I never have to worry about a T-nut rotating after overuse. In hindsight, I probably should have went with the hammer-in kind, as I do have a few of them on my wall and they seem to be pretty fine. When selecting a T-nut, ensure it has at least four prongs. They sell them with six if you prefer some overkill. When mounting your plywood, it should really be done with two people but I was able to build my entire wall by myself, including loading sheets of plywood onto the roof of my car and tying them down for the drive home. I slide the sheets into my apartment, and then to place them on the wall, I built temporary holders I could slide one end of the board into, like you see here. Then I secured the corners first before putting in all the screws. I used six inch spacing between screws, using number eight, two inch Robson head screws to secure the plywood. Once your whole wall is complete, it's a good idea to give it a sanding. I pre-sanded as I built, but I gave it one last final sand with 120 grit paper. You can buy these drill adapters relatively cheap for sanding rather than using a dedicated sander, and they work just as well. You can also buy pre-sanded sheets of plywood, but those are usually $15 to $20 more expensive, and are not worth it as it only takes a minute or two to sand an entire sheet. The flooring was an unexpected challenge I had to overcome, as it was somewhat of an afterthought in my project. I needed something which would prevent injuries from high falls on my back. Crash pads usually consist of 75% open cell foam and 25% closed cell foam on top. The open cell foam absorbs the impact while the closed cell foam is stiffer and helps disperse the impact across the whole surface area. I determined that an 8 inch or thicker crash pad would work for me, but soon realized most suppliers of crash pads charge extraordinary amounts of money for their pads. A 12 by 12 floor such as mine was looking to cost well over $2,000. I then looked into building my own by visiting a couple local foam shops, only to find the price of open and closed cell foam to be far too high. I wondered why I even needed to buy from a foam shop. Why couldn't I just buy from the supplier or manufacturer and cut out the middleman? Unfortunately, I couldn't find information on foam suppliers who would sell outside of a business contract. I ended up throwing my 11-inch pillow top mattress down to test out a fall, and it worked surprisingly well. It was soft enough for a fall anywhere except from the very top, so I scoured Craigslist posts for free mattresses. My idea was to buy a 1-inch thick layer of closed cell foam to spread out the impact across a bunch of free mattresses. This turned out to work even better than I thought. When I land on my crash pads, it feels just like the ones in the gym. While searching Craigslist, I also found that most mattresses have almost no resale value, for obvious reasons. That means that every day there was a plethora of selections to be made. I ended up finding a pillow top queen mattress, a spring king mattress, a foam full mattress, and two foam single mattresses. Foam mattresses are the best, and just as good as the $200 foam from the foam shop, except, you know, for free. They're a little harder to come by, however. The queen pillow top I picked up smelled of sweat and B.O. really bad. 
I knew it was stained when I picked it up, and didn't care since I'd be covering it, but I failed to notice the smell which was so strong on the mattress because the guy's whole apartment smelled like that. So to get rid of the smell, I sprayed the whole thing in vinegar. After the vinegar had dried, I sprinkled baking soda on top to let it sit overnight. The next day I vacuumed up the baking soda, but there was still some smell, so I repeated the process. After a second go, all the odor had dissipated, but I encased the mattress in a vinyl mattress cover just to be safe. Be careful when you pick up a used mattress. Inspect for bed bugs and living conditions of the person first like I did, and check for smell thoroughly like I failed to do. The king mattress I picked up had no problem at all. I threw one inch of closed cell foam on top and wrapped the king and the queen in a huge tarp. The flooring works, but I do hope to replace both of the mattresses with open cell foam in the future if I can come across some. My other two pads, which are made from foam, are also much more comfortable and lighter. One doubles as a lie down bed for my computer, or a guest bed, and the other is a great seat as well, which I've wrapped in a mattress sheet. To make the smaller pad, I cut two single foam mattresses and use spray adhesive to bond the foam together. If you're going to do this, make sure you give the foam plenty of time to dry and ensure you're wearing a safety mask while working so you don't breathe in any glue fumes. In total, my only costs were three 4x9 sheets of closed cell foam, which cost me around $100 each. Well, I suppose the mattress covers and tarps cost a little bit more too. For the holds, there are several different types of holds you can buy. I bought a starter kit from Matulis, which are all standard plastic holds. It came with bolt and screw-on holds. It helped fill my wall, but I'm not that big of a fan of them. I ended up ordering many holds from Sinrock Holds and driving to the border to save on shipping. Since their holds are a bit less, they ended up coming around to the same price in the end. Their holds are like ceramic and feel a lot like sandstone. They have a much better feel to them and they don't rotate as much. I'm a little disappointed that all of my holds do not have set screw holes on them to prevent rotation as they seem to loosen up quickly. I'll be drilling in some screw holes around the outside into my wall to prevent hold rotating. One thing for sure is I know I don't need to worry about the T-nuts doing any rotating. I have lots of big roof jugs to start and a few slopers, but I do plan to get more in the future. I also want to build my own campus rungs and place them on the far side of my wall. Holds really are a whole other topic in itself, however. I have a few pictures of the building process I can talk about here. This picture shows the first part of my framework. I used L-bracket plates to secure the wood together. Here are some joist hangers which will be used for the rest of the wood which supports the angled wall. This was the saw I used for my project. It's a compact circular saw which has a 2 inch cut depth and takes up a lot less room than a full size saw and it worked out great. You can also see my speed square here which is used for drawing straight edges and cutting the angles I needed. I also had to build a simple platform which I clamped wood to for making cuts. This is the bottom of the board with joist hangers screwed on. Here you can see a temporary 2x4 I placed along the back wall to hold the 2x6 as I attached it to the ceiling studs as I didn't have anybody to hold the 2x6 in place for me. A project like this will create a lot of sawdust. It may be beneficial to use a vacuum attachment for your saw. I didn't have one which is why you can see this mess here. This is my framework completed, including the cross bracing which I toenailed into place to increase rigidity. Here I am on the overhang corner. I'm testing out the completed framework to ensure that everything is solid and that it has no trouble holding my weight. I hope this video was able to help you decide about making your own wall, or help with one you're already building. Head to the comments below if you have any questions, as I'm sure I missed some stuff, and I'll try to update the description with an FAQ. Thanks for watching.